The next hot topic is deep brain stimulation. This is a treatment that has been used for many, many years in Parkinson's disease, uh, essential tremor, and dystonia. And within the past year, we have seen a few published reports, but most of the attention to deep brain stimulation for Tourette syndrome has been uh, through mass media, uh, news shows, and, uh, and such. Uh, Jorge, can you talk to us a little bit about what deep brain stimulation is for Tourette syndrome and what it entails and, and what we should think about it? Deep brain stimulation in Tourette syndrome is an initiative that was taken initially by the Europeans, uh, particularly groups in Netherlands and Milan and at Case Western Reserve University in, in this uh, end of the Atlantic. And basically, um, these investigators had been looking at the possibility of interrupting these uh, cortical, subcortical circuits that we think are responsible for the perpetuation of uh, symptoms that we see in movement disorders. And as you already pointed out, uh, uh, Parkinson's disease and tremor have been uh, entities within movement disorders that have been very carefully studied using um, these techniques. And these techniques were born out of the notion that uh, rather than put a permanent lesion in someone's brain to cure symptoms that are mediated by the abnormalities in these circuits, that you could better modulate the effect of the lesion by simply putting a stimulator, which is like a pacemaker, that would then pace the activity in that circuit in a way that is favorable to the symptoms without necessarily destroying it. The premise being that that uh, by not destroying the tissue, you do not destroy fibers of passage that may be going through that, that uh, part of the brain, but have nothing to do with the symptoms themselves. And we know from experience in other movement disorders that sometimes when you destroy the tissue, you may get inadvertent side effects that may appear either immediately or later. The deep brain stimulation pacemaker approach also offers the possibility of being able to fine tune the degree of stimulation uh, that an individual patient may require, therefore allowing for more uh, individu individualization of the treatment. Um, so in Tourette's, the uh, published literature that you're referring to and some of the uh, lay press reports uh, suggest that deep brain stimulation to an area of the brain to in fact various areas of the brain, and I'll go back into it, can provide a tremendous uh, relief to the tick symptoms. So the first target that has been looked at, uh, which began in the Netherlands, has been the medial thalamus, which is an area of the brain that is responsible for activation of the cortex, and that area of the brain is in turn uh, controlled through filtering mechanisms that are part of what we call the basal ganglia where we think that there's uh, dopamine dysregulation or, uh, or abnormalities of dopaminergic transmission that in some way sustain the symptoms of Tourette. So the approach of the surgery is to address the problems that occur downstream from that problem of dopamine dysregulation and in so doing sort of address the abnormalities of cortical activation that may be occurring in Tourette. Having said that, the problem is that most of these studies have been open label on control and we know for a fact from studies that have been done in Parkinson's uh, long before that every time you open someone's skull and do something in their brain, the, uh, the investiture that that person has uh, put into the procedure uh, of putting their life at risk in essence is such that uh, there's a very high tendency of making fancy of their own folly. I mean, after you make such an investment, it is very hard for you to accept the fact that, oh my God, this didn't work. So, so there's a large placebo effect, and we have shown that time and again in, in Parkinson's, and ergo the importance of doing control studies to really find the, uh, the, the truth about the, uh, the, both the risk and the efficacy of these uh, procedures. Having said that, the data so far looks... Uh, uh, important enough, if not promising enough, that the TSA has taken the initiative of, of uh, putting together a, a global meeting, bringing experts from all over the world who are already practicing the procedure to see if we can hold everyone's feet to the fire and begin to communicate so that we don't repeat the same mistakes that have been repeated in the case of Parkinson's disease and tremor going way back to the 1950s when stereotactic surgery began to come of age. 
Great review, Larry. Really wonderful. So let me ask a question that I think many folks would ask, and and that is, as we've discussed before, Tourette is a hyperkinetic disorder. We believe that these circuits are firing when they shouldn't in a way, and yet we're going to stimulate them. So that sounds a little backwards. Can, can you kind of explain that? Uh, it's a very good question that, that we have asked physiologists all the time. What, what are you doing when you turn that stimulator on? Are you really stimulating? Or are you stimulating inhibitory areas that are essentially causing more inhibition? And the, uh, without getting into uh, tremendous detail, the, the story now from the physiologist is this. Initially, we thought that a, a, a no signal is better than a bad signal. So we thought that what the stimulator was doing was just jamming a bad signal and therefore getting rid of it. And in so doing, alleviating the symptoms. Then uh, some people still felt that there was some uh, retrograde stimulation that would essentially provide some negative feedback to the circuit and shutting down some of the abnormal activity. And now we think that, that, uh, that this sort of retrograde stimulation to other areas of the basal ganglia may be some of the, uh, the reason why these uh, stimulators actually do work. So that even though we call them stimulator, what your point makes is that that may be a misnomer of usage of terminology that, that we have carried over the years. But the, the patients who are coming to the attention of surgical centers are not your average uh, Tourette patient. So I guess one point to be made is that this uh, surgery is not, uh, this is not a progressive illness. So the chances are, are that your child or your loved one is never going to come to that point because we don't have a progression. There's a subset of patients who may be candidates, and I must say that it's going to be a very small minority, and I venture to say that no neurosurgeon, no center is going to get rich on this because you're going to be talking uh, a very small number of cases per year. I think it's a very exciting area, but boy, it scares me, especially when most of what we know about the syndrome comes from the television. <laughs> So, uh, you mean most of what we know about DBS? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, excuse me. Most of what we know about DBS comes from, from reports on television. And, and you can surmise that the television reports are usually the spectacular cases that, that, that there is a tendency out there in the clinical community not to necessarily uh, showcase your failure. So, that one of the first suspicions that we have is that are we just seeing the, the good news but failing to report the bad news? So what would you say to clinicians who, who uh, care for someone with very, very severe Tourette syndrome who might be interested? What, what, should they, what should they be thinking about? What should they be saying to their patient about, about DBS? Well, DBS is not standard of care. I think that we view it as still as, a, as a, a procedure that needs to be uh, examined carefully and tested so that in a patient that is seriously considering that and a clinician who's seriously considering referring a patient that I would only refer them to centers that are looking at this in a rigorous way so that five years down the line we're not asking the same questions that we're asking. So it's a complicated procedure. It's complicated. Exciting. Expensive. Expensive. <laughs> um, and we should stay tuned and not, and if we, if we have patients who might be candidates, think about referring them to centers that are, are developing the expertise and collecting the data so we can learn something from their experience. Absolutely. That was great, Jorge. Thank you.